That's no moon, it's a Dracula on Game Boy Works Advance Episode 2. Typically on these works series, I've taken a consistent pattern with launch lineups. I tackle all the first party releases up front, then touch on the third party titles. Game Boy Works Advance demands a different strategy, however. Until now, the launch lineups we've seen have been fairly small and thin on third party titles. The one exception has been the NES, which had 16 or 17 games available at its test launch in the US, but all of those games were either Nintendo developed or Nintendo published. Even the two iRim properties had their NES versions developed internally by Nintendo R&D4. But with Game Boy Advance, we have what we might term Nintendo's first proper modern era system launch. That is, its first post-Dreamcast launch. Dreamcast's September 1999 American debut had been the biggest console launch of all time in terms of the available library of titles that hit on day one, and Sony quickly followed suit by shipping even more games alongside PlayStation 2 the following October. And now here we are with Nintendo's first post-Dreamcast launch, March 2001 in Japan, and a few months later in the rest of the world. And it attempts to hit that same expansive bar with 25 games available day one. Unlike with NES though, these weren't first party games. In total, only four of the 25 came from Nintendo, and two of those wouldn't even ship in the US. The rest were third party releases, and of these titles, it's arguably Konami's Castlevania Circle of the Moon that best shows off the system's capabilities. Well, that or Mega Man Battle Network, but Circle shipped alongside the console in all territories, while Battle Network took a little longer to localize for other regions, and therefore was only a launch release in Japan. So we're going to jump immediately from Mario to Castlevania to see just what the GBA was capable of. This is a great showcase of the system's capabilities, a game with enormous impact, though it must be said that Circle shows off the system's flaws too. Unlike Super Mario Advance, this isn't some repackaging of old assets and content. Circle definitely reuses some material from previous Castlevania games, but that happens to be almost entirely on the audio side. The visuals have been built from the ground up for Circle, at least as far as I'm aware, which would make this the last 2D Castlevania release not to recycle sprites and backgrounds. Likewise, the castle layout and the core game systems are entirely new here as well. In short, this is a wholly new Castlevania game, designed in the style of Symphony of the Night, and with visuals and music that often exceed anything seen or heard in the series outings on Super NES, PC Engine, or Genesis. No other cartridge to hit stores on the same day as the GBA hardware felt more like a proclamation of what the system was capable of and what its owners could look forward to. This was a game worthy of 16-bit consoles, designed in the fashion of a 32-bit masterpiece, and you could hold it in your hands, play it on the bus, in the bathroom, or even outdoors. In fact, you definitely wanted to play it outdoors. Circle of the Moon is a gorgeous game with visuals far exceeding any portable release that had preceded it, obviously discounting games played on Nomad or Turbo Express, which don't really count, but it was definitely a game designed before the developers had real hardware in hand. For all Circle's strengths, it also had the ad fortune to show off the original GBA model's biggest flaw, an incredibly dark reflective screen that practically demands direct sunlight to be usable. That's not an exaggeration, which is why Hideo Kojima produced a series of games that had to be played in direct sunlight with Boktai. To its credit, the TFT Nintendo used for Game Boy Advance was a massive step up over the original Game Boy, Game Boy Pocket, or even Game Boy Color. It was on par in terms of quality with SNK's Neo Geo Pocket color screen, if not even better, reproducing colors well and minimizing motion blur. Unfortunately, whether because they were cutting costs to keep the hardware to a competitive $90, or because backlighting tech wasn't quite to the point that it was energy efficient enough to be a reasonable feature on a system powered by a pair of AA batteries, Nintendo didn't bother including any sort of built-in screen illumination for Game Boy Advance. This was a godsend to accessory manufacturers and aftermarket modders who turned GBA lighting kits into a cottage industry, but it sure sucked for Castlevania. The footage you see here, recorded directly from an official Nintendo developer kit, looks incredible. Circle's visuals are rich, atmospheric, and detailed. They're also quite dark. The game looks incredible when played on pretty much any latter-day solution, whether that's a sidelit GBA revision model, Wii U Virtual Console, Woozle's GBA Consoleizer, or even just emulation. At launch, though, Castlevania's GBA debut was kind of a miserable experience. It was so unpleasant to try to make out the action here, in fact, that the team behind the follow-up game swung too far in the other direction in order to ensure it had sufficient visual contrast to be enjoyable. And that's a shame, because this is a solid, if 
flawed take on the Castlevania formula that helped nudge the series back on track after several years of flailing aimlessly. Few would dispute that 1997's Symphony of the Night was an instant classic, but that wasn't the direction Konami really had in mind for the franchise. They saw Castlevania as a 3D tentpole series, which led to the incomplete Castlevania for Nintendo 64, the finished not quite a prequel repackaging that was Legacy of Darkness, and the abortive Castlevania Resurrection for Dreamcast. Somewhere in there, we also had the lackluster Castlevania Legends for Game Boy. Circle was the first attempt by Konami to tap into the elements that made Symphony so beloved among fans. They did not, however, tap into the team that made Symphony. Circle was developed by Konami's Kobe-based studio, a short-lived division that largely focused on Nintendo platforms. Perhaps this accounts for why Circle gets the broad strokes of the Metroidvania formula right, but stumbles in a way the non-linear entries helmed by Symphony co-director Koji Igarashi never did. KCE Kobe had produced the two N64 Castlevania entries, which included plenty of good ideas despite their flaws, but those were very different games than the non-linear 2D adventures whose tradition Circle belongs to. Really though, that's par for the course with Circle. Everything here feels just a little off. Not bad always, but definitely out of sync with the rest of the franchise. For starters, Circle doesn't involve the Belmont family at all. Instead, it stars Nathan Graves, an apprentice of a vampire hunter named Morris Baldwin, seemingly a reference to both Quincy Morris of Bram Stoker's novel and John Morris of Castlevania Bloodlines, except Morris is his first name rather than his family name. At the same time, Nathan wields the hunter whip rather than the vampire killer, and the story is set 10 years after a never-seen defeat of Dracula at the hands of the Baldwin and Graves families. In other words, Circle of the Moon takes part in the Castlevania lineage without seeming to concern itself with the particulars, which is not a big deal ultimately, but these minor nitpicks led to an official decision to exclude Circle from the canonical Castlevania timeline a few years later. Even the behavior of some of the core game mechanics feels strange. The Hunter Whip harkens back to Super Castlevania 4 in that holding down the attack button after striking with the whip causes it to deploy a secondary function. Unlike Simon Belmont's 16-bit whip, however, the Hunter Whip doesn't dangle loosely. Instead, Nathan spins it rapidly like a jump rope. This is actually remarkably useful, serving as a handy shield against enemy projectiles and minor infinitely spawning foes. But the only time this feature would ever resurface was as a minor option in the next GBA title, which contributes to the sensation that Circle is an evolutionary Galapagos for the series, packed with elements that exist in isolation. All of this aside, Circle is a decent take on the Metroidvania concept. If it stumbles in areas, it also does plenty well. Perhaps its greatest strength is its map design, which is one of the absolute best non-linear castle environments ever to appear in the series. It's not surprising then that producer Koji Horie would go on to design the maps in DS Castlevania sequels Portrait of Ruin and Order of Ecclesia, and direct the stealth Castlevania clone Shaman King Master of Spirits. This incarnation of Dracula's castle contains some decent environmental storytelling. The game begins with a cutscene set in the castle's reception chamber, with the sorceress named Carmilla resurrecting Dracula straight away. Although Dracula is too weakened by his recent defeat to immediately slaughter the vampire hunters confronting him, he does banish both Nathan and Morris's son Hugh to the catacombs below. The next few hours unfold a bit like Kid Icarus, with Nathan fighting his way out of the dungeons. There's a nice sense of accomplishment once you finally make your way back to the reception room where the adventure began, and a great moment of realization when you discover it's directly adjacent to the long introductory hallway that's been a mainstay of the franchise since the very first game. The castle map has a great flow to it, with a few mission-critical choke points to break up the game into a few major sections and force players to overcome certain tasks before advancing further. Within these sections, however, players are given a lot of freedom to maneuver and explore. The castle generally feels less harshly divided than in Egovania games, with areas bleeding into the next, sometimes with doors and sometimes without. Although the background tunes generally define the major areas of the castle, these can change instantly between innocuous seeming screen divisions, without loading rooms and sometimes even without doors to break them up. All the familiar touchstones of the castle are present, from a clock tower filled with Medusa heads to a weirdly out of place chapel, but they're shuffled in a way that makes them feel less formulaic than in many other entries of the series. In short, the castle is mostly a pleasure to explore when you can see what you're doing. Nathan controls well, with one significant exception, and he comes with his very own experience-based leveling system that causes him to become more powerful as a natural function of exploring the expansive game world. There are enemies both familiar and new, ranging from the usual skeletons and zombies to powerful new creations like devils and demonesses. Nathan mostly relies on a whip and the standard set of Castlevania sub-weapons, though these are both augmented by an expansive skill system called DSS that can completely change the flow and style of gameplay. And naturally, most progress is dependent on defeating screen-filling bosses who guard critical navigational skill enhancements. Circle's castle breaks down in the same ways that the rest of the game gets hung up. 
not on major flaws, but on small nagging details that create needless friction. The castle's biggest shortcomings have to do with its gating and with room placement. The gating, that is the obstructions and obstacles that guide the player's advancement, lacks the organic feel of the best Metroidvanias. Circle's castle contains a surprising number of arbitrary barriers that only exist to prevent progress. For every natural obstruction you encounter, like the need to purify the poisonous water of the underground waterway before you can cross it, you also encounter pointless contrivances. You'll find both bricks and boxes that block passageways in exactly the same manner, and each one requires the use of a special ability that basically only exists for the purpose of clearing away those obstructions. That's disappointing, but it's not as frustrating as the clumsy placement of save rooms. The save rooms here have a tendency to show up at inconvenient locations. There are a few especially grueling stretches of the castle that can be incredibly taxing to pass through safely in your first attempt, especially when you can barely see the screen, and the one thing these gauntlets have in common is that they're not immediately followed by a convenient save point. There's nothing more frustrating than struggling through a nasty sequence of combat only to find yourself desperately seeking out a place to heal and save with no luck. Well, no, that's not true. What's even more frustrating is pulling out a narrow victory against a powerful boss only to die to some scrub foe before you can save. Circle of the Moon has a tendency of placing its save rooms a short trek from boss lairs rather than directly across from them as in every single Igavania ever. You inexplicably don't receive a standard healing crystal after defeating a boss, meaning you have to slog back to the save point with your health in a potentially critical state after your hard-earned victory. This is a minor complaint, but it does embody the small quality of life shortcomings that make Circle a little more unfriendly than it ought to be. Another great example of this is the oddly sluggish way in which Nathan moves. By default, Nathan strides forward at a snail's pace, and the natural arc of his leaps is extremely vertical. This is a pretty strange choice, given the GBA's widescreen resolution. Why emphasize the vertical rather than taking advantage of the console's natural format? But it becomes even more irritating once you collect your first skill enhancement a mere few minutes into the game. Nathan's very first power-up is the ability to break into a run by double-tapping the D-pad in either direction. Once you acquire the dash skill, there's very little reason not to use it 99% of the time, which means that you spend the entire game double-tapping the controls to make him move around and jump a decent distance, rather than just making the dash's default move. Even more vexing is the game's emphasis on random chance. Circle is the only non-linear Castlevania game to lack any sort of in-game economy. There are no cash bags dropping from the candles you whip. And even if there were, there would be no place to spend them. Nathan has a complete inventory system, but the whole thing is literally reliant on luck. If you want better gear or consumable potions, you need to figure out which enemies drop them. Then you need to spend however long it takes repeatedly killing them until you give that desired loot. The scarcity of resources makes the back half of the game absolutely miserable. The castle repopulates with new enemies as you progress, with weak mobs being replaced by large, powerful damage sponges who love to dish out status effects. The underground waterway and underground warehouse areas in particular are some of the least enjoyable segments of any Castlevania game ever. The waterway is packed with tedious puzzles patrolled by enemies who can inflict debilitating freeze status on Nathan from off-screen, while the warehouse is made of tight corridors packed with fast-moving foes that love to hit you with poison status. Unless you want to burn through the scarce antidotes you've picked up, you have to progress at a snail's pace to ward off toxic monsters whose poison ailments will steadily chew through more than a third of Nathan's health before clearing up. The game simply expects you to spend long hours grinding for experience levels in consumables in order to be able to survive these tough areas and the insanely unfair final battle with Dracula. This emphasis on random luck is a nuisance in any game, but it's even worse here thanks to the lack of an in-game bestiary to offer any sort of guidance for which enemies carry what. Even Symphony of the Night had that to help you sort through the random drops, and that game also had a shop, along with lots of gear stashed throughout the castle, so you didn't need to rely on the RNG to power up. But the only gear upgrades you'll find here are the ones that enemies drop when defeated. These typically have a likelihood of appearing that ranges from anywhere to 1 in 15 to a 1 in 300 chance, and there's no way to know the whys and wherefores of any of this without consulting a guide. And even that wouldn't be so bad if not for the fact that the same randomness applies to the game's central innovation, the brilliant DSS mechanic. DSS, or Dual Setup System, is a very on-trend card collecting mechanic that allows you to greatly enhance or even modify Nathan's skills. Consisting of 20 cards that can be combined in pairs of two, DSS is an incredibly versatile concept. All told, it results in no less than 100 different modifiers for Nathan based on how you combine cards from two different categories, skill and attribute. The top row of cards, the skill cards, grant Nathan different combat capabilities. These are named after various Roman gods who hint at the nature of the bonuses that the card confers. God of War Mars, for example, alters the Hunter Whip into a completely different weapon, while Venus boosts individual stats. 
The bottom row is named for mythic beasts, each of which ties to that card's elemental attribute. Salamander unlocks flame base effect, Cockatrice involves petrifaction, and Thunderbird naturally creates electrical powers. You can only set one DSS pairing at a time, and a DSS effect has to be activated manually by pressing the L trigger. DSS enhancements drain energy from Nathan's magic meter, which recharges automatically when no DSS skill is in effect, some based on time and others on a per-action basis. DSS is incredibly versatile. You can give Nathan's attack an elemental or status effect, boost his resistance to different hazards, summon creatures, or create elemental shields. This game doesn't explain what each pairing does until you actually make effective use of that skill, so there's a lot of experimentation involved in learning the ins and outs of DSS. It's a case where the game's lack of upfront information actually plays out well. Every time you acquire a new card, you immediately want to experiment with it and see what it does. Some combinations are better than others, and some turn out to be far more effective than you might expect. For example, the Mandragora card doesn't simply add plant status effect to Nathan's capabilities, it also tends to enhance his physical power pretty dramatically. It's such a great system that it's the one element of Circle of the Moon to have survived into the sequels. Harmony of Dissonance pretty much copied it wholesale, and it clearly served as the basis for the excellent soul and glyph systems that appeared in later Castlevanias, and even in Bloodstained Ritual of the Night. The one other feature to carry forward is the hero versus rival story setup. Pretty much every Castlevania that followed Circle carried forward the friction that develops here between Nathan and his pal Hugh. Anyway, DSS allows you to do some really wild things, and the whole system totally opens up the game to be played however you like. Or at least, that's the theory anyway. In practice, not so much. As with items and equipment, DSS is an entirely random system dependent on enemies dropping them when defeated. And as with items and equipment, you have absolutely no way of knowing which enemies carry cards. There are only a few cards you're absolutely guaranteed to acquire in a given playthrough of Circle because their drop rate is so high, it's pretty much impossible to avoid them. But for the most part, the remainder of the 20 cards are held by various monsters throughout the castle, with no way to know outside of a strategy guide which monsters carry what. I suppose you could make the case that the scarcity and randomness makes each playthrough different based on which powers you have access to, but in practice it just feels like Nathan is critically lacking unless you grind endlessly for card drops. You can easily miss some incredibly crucial or valuable skills thanks to the way the DSS drops are handled. Consider the Mercury-Serpent combo, which takes a page from Super Metroid. Like Samus Aran's Ice Beam, Mercury-Serpent freezes enemies instead of striking them with a killing blow, allowing Nathan to use them as mid-air stepping stones. This is an incredibly useful ability, and it's entirely possible to go the entire game without finding it. While the Mercury card is one of the can't-miss basics, the Serpent card is much harder to find. It's held only by two foes, one of which is the Earth Demon, a monster that only appears a couple of times near the beginning of the game a foe that is dangerously powerful and difficult to kill when you're actually traversing those areas. Most players will run up against the Earth Demon and nope right on past rather than dealing with its high defense, erratic movements, and powerful attacks. But even those who do choose to face off against the Earth Demons they encounter still aren't likely to drop a Serpent card for their trouble because that enemy has only a 1 in 40 chance of dropping it. The Serpent card does drop more frequently from a different enemy toward the end of the game, but by that point it's vastly less useful. You have the Jet Boot ability, so you don't need to freeze enemies into platforms. This is the case for most DSS cards. Their randomness and scarcity diminish their value, and the utility of the powers they confer. The upshot of this emphasis on randomness is that it tends to channel a player's approach into a character build focused on luck. The higher Nathan's luck stat, the more likely rare items are to drop. So equipment like the Lucky Ring becomes essential. Though of course you need to be lucky enough to find a Lucky Ring in the first place. I don't mean to bag on Circle of the Moon's shortcomings, because it's honestly a remarkable achievement, a landmark portable game. But its flaws are frustrating precisely because Circle is otherwise so great. Between the dim graphics, play mechanics that feel awkwardly married to the GBA's resolution, and the constant randomness of key play factors, Circle of the Moon falls short of becoming the classic it truly deserves to be. It's ultimately gone down in history as kind of the forgotten portable Castlevania, and perhaps more critically, as a case study for other developers to see which mistakes to avoid when designing for GBA. I will say that Circle actually plays better now than it did at the time, thanks to the range of options available for experiencing it on something besides the default GBA screen. This doesn't change the fundamental emphasis on randomness and the clumsy gating design, but dealing with nasty monsters and the projectiles they like to fire from off-screen is a lot less annoying when you can see the screen in the first place. But isn't this always the way of launch games? Showing off the potential of a new system while stumbling a bit over its shortcomings? Circle of the Moon did a fantastic job of showing off the capabilities of the GBA, bringing a rich, console-quality Castlevania experience to the handheld. Its sequels would largely improve on its design, and in some ways, Circle even exceeded them. Ironically, Circle might have been guilty of overselling the system's capabilities, at least where sound was concerned. 
The GBA had pretty meager sound hardware, and Circle's composers kind of cheated, but not really relying on the built-in audio chip. Instead, Circle's soundtrack appears to use extensive audio sampling. It sounds great, despite seemingly suffering from a significant amount of static, probably the result of low bitrate audio samples. Most of the soundtrack consists of classic Castlevania tracks, but these aren't simple recreations. They've been completely rearranged to great effect. The Machine Tower, for example, features a manic rendition of Castlevania 3's Clockwork. While the outer wall area takes the sinking old sanctuary from Bloodlines and amps it up with a thick baseline and great ambiance. The handful of original tracks, most notably the first area's theme, Awakening, sound every bit as good. Only a handful of GBAs would ultimately sound as good as Circle of the Moon, thanks to the limitations and constraints of the hardware sound capabilities. Oh, yeah. hey, baby. Do my thing. But it was such a nice lie. Thanks to its great music and ambitious design, Circle of the Moon made a strong impression at GBA's launch. It's definitely not a perfect game, but it's hard to explain just how astonishing it was to see a work of this scale and depth on a handheld. Anyway, it's not like this was the only Game Boy Advance title to suffer from the system's mediocre screen. They all did. Circle of the Moon has definitely been surpassed by subsequent portable Metroidvanias, but that shouldn't diminish the fact that this was a hell of an experience back in 2001. Next time on Game Boy Works Advance, a little more of that old Super NES magic. <laughs> <laughs>